Welcome everyone in Schema Therapy Made Simple. I'm very pleased today to be joined with Hagara Feldman coming all the way to us from Israel. And she's going to be talking to us about uh, the topic of online schema therapy and also limited reparenting, which are two of her special interests. So welcome, Hagara. Hi, thank you, Nadine, for having me. And thank you for the introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just a, um, a real joy to be able to have guests from all over the world come and um, showcase what schema therapy is about, but also the reach that it has across the globe, which is um, something that not everybody is aware of. So, yeah, I'm so pleased that you said yes to the invitation. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, for those who don't know Hagar, I'm just going to introduce her um, to you. She is an ISST Advanced Schema Therapist mm -hmm. Supervisor and Trainer. And she's the director of Schema Therapy Kva Saba, which provides ISST approved schema therapy training in Israel. And she's also the former board member of ST, which was the Israel Association for Schema Therapy. And she's an accredited CBT supervisor and specialist. Um, she's become solid in her experience and use of schema therapy and she likes to combine that with CBT. And she's practiced both in the public and private sectors and um, in the areas of mental health and bariatric services. So she's practicing online mostly, providing therapy and supervision from her practice in the Tanya in Israel. Um, and Hagar is specials in access one disorders, personality disorders. She works with Holocaust survivors, and LGBT plus related issues. Um, and as well as that, she works across cultures um, with many different types of people, both in Israel and online across the globe. So that is really, I think, I could have had you on to talk about a lot of things um, in there because you are working, and I think it's for those of us with um, established careers we've often done a lot of things but yeah there's you, you definitely cover a lot of interesting areas so again welcome and firstly tell us a bit about how you became a schema therapy um, therapist and trainer okay first of all thank you <laughs> for, for yeah again for the introduction uh, yeah and I'm a curious person that's why I'm sometimes getting all over <laughs> the place and it's been quite many years <laughs> so yeah but yeah. yeah basically I was trained in CBT uh, which I found there and still find very useful for access one uh, but I think you know earlier when I was just a uh, younger therapist uh, it felt like in many cases that it was not enough there were issues or situations in the therapy room especially that they didn't know how to address you know like nesting marks or limits breaks and on the other end uh, patients who stayed in therapy uh, even after the excess money order was sold mm -hmm. and I was convinced I understood that there was something in mm -hmm. the connection and there uh, you know in the relationship that keeps them but I didn't know how to formulate it and how to work with it. And back then, I think it was around 2005, schema therapy was not popular or familiar in Israel at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. had kind of short exposure to it in my master degree, but it wasn't enough. And there were no accreditation programs in Israel yet. Uh, there was one place to learn it, to Kind of a deeper level it's been done by uh upper pellet if yeah, maybe yeah. part of the people know it very lovely and, and talented um therapist psychologist and it was good the course was really good it provided some answers but i didn't go on with supervision and again it was not part of the accreditation program yet so it yeah. kind of stayed in the background and i think about two years later when Eshkol Rafaeli, maybe you also know his yeah. name. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's, he's lovely. He came back uh, from the US to Israel after he's been working uh, and praying with uh, Jeffrey Young itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there we started a full training course. We created a small um, group of uh, 
supervision with some friends who were actually the first, um, the first group of therapists in Israel that were accredited um, as chemotherapists. A certain point, Wendy Behari also came to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and after workshops, we, um, we also started supervision with her, which go on till now. No one can leave Wendy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be hard to give up. As long as she's here, we're, we're holding on to her. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so it sounds like yeah. it was a bit of a journey that unfolded over time. And it really came from that initial recognition that um, there were these things going on in the relationship and in the personality structure of clients that wasn't really able to be addressed in CBT. And so that curious part of you went looking and exploring. And I always say the best therapists are the curious ones because we want to find those answers and we want to help. Um, and rather than get sort of married to a therapy or become religious about a therapy, we go, what else? What could yeah. help here? Exactly, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so eventually I was certified as supervisor in 2012, and my training program is running for about the last three or four years, which is great. I love teaching, even that they have unrelenting standard <laughs> schema, as we discussed before, which doesn't make it easy, but still, I enjoy it, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And uh, you have an, an online training. It's on demand and it's with Dr. Z Liu, who I had the pleasure of speaking with recently. Um, tell me a bit about, because that folk course focuses on online schema therapy. So tell me a little bit about the course and what led up to developing that training. Yeah. Okay. So Z, yeah, Z is wonderful. I would, yeah, we had this chemistry that I think was really helpful in creating this workshop. But it, I have to say, I think even before, uh, before that, um, I think that the online supervision with Wendy was like made it really clear for me, you know, like emotionally, how it can feel real and close and warm, even when you don't see the person ever. Mm -hmm. um, when I met her in Istanbul, uh, I think it was 2014, we had such a long, warm hug and it just felt like, okay, all these years, we actually met each other mm -hmm. in real life. And, and this is kind of, yeah, made it very clear for me that the physical uh, presence is not necessary. It's not, it's not a must to create a real relationship. Yes. And at that time, somehow, Mystically, I don't know how I got new uh, requests <laughs> for online therapy and supervision from people outside of Israel. And that's really excited me because I've been always uh, curious and, and enthusiastic about cultures. Um, so when Z uh, created the special interest group, I was so happy, finally, an opportunity, you know, to, to hear others from different countries dealing with the same questions and concerns um, and started with, with like the Amsterdam conference in 2018. The SAG uh, we presented something small, kind of a round table or group presentation. It was very, you know, the online therapy was kind of fringe off Broadway <laughs> part of therapy. <laughs> yeah. In general, and of course, in schema therapy, people did not take it seriously. It was kind. So, you know, the, the conference organization or uh, organizers, they gave us such a small <laughs> time spot. And I think we all were so surprised that people even showed up to the presentation. <laughs> mm. uh, but they did. So it was nice, and the same year, um, um, I, I offered Z to create something longer and, and like more solid for a conference that took place in Rome. Um, it was like the process of, you know, creating the workshop was so enjoyable. It was so fun, 
and we used um, part of the TV series uh, with Lisa Kudro. I don't know if yes, you yeah, know. Yeah, nice. Online therapy was really like crazy therapist who's <laughs> doing online uh, therapy. And we used it to demonstrate like what not to do. We also prepared. <laughs> We also prepared to like strong, serious case studies and, and really started to feel like, okay, it's, it's, it's getting more serious and more like solid. Again, we were surprised in Rome, but we had a full room. And uh, following that experience, we kept working on the workshop and developing it. And we kind of used our own ideas and ideas that came from the SIG members. Mm -hmm. submitted to Copenhagen 2020 again just a short time mm -hmm. slot but COVID wow you know all yeah. of a sudden everyone <laughs> had to move to online and even the conference so it turned to be so important we were asked to present the full workshop and people were so confused and anxious about you know working online so mm -hmm. It was helpful. It included some, some just basic stuff that everyone, everyone knows, I think, by now, like how to create the setting on our side and on the client side, and how to set limits, how to use the, the, um, the right lighting and stuff, but also the more like deeper aspects of schema therapy, like modes activations, uh, experiential work, and stuff like that and I think you know now it's like online therapy became kind of the norm right like a regular therapy offering uh, it's been pitched in universities there's research and books actually there's a new book coming soon mm -hmm. um at the beginning of uh this year I think it's going to be January or February um if you want, I can send you the chapter. It's um, uh, the, the book is called Advances in Online uh, Therapy. And uh -huh. it's really nice because it's built in a way that every chapter is devoted to another um, um, therapy, um, yeah, another therapy uh, style or um, Great. attitude. Yeah, and I can send them um, later. The, the, That'd be the lovely. Chapter. Lovely. Yeah. And I think you raise a good point in that um, it seems like, oh, online therapy now, because we lived through COVID and we were literally forced to practice that way. But that's the truth yeah. is that many people did not want to practice online. They were frightened of it. Um, they had all sorts of ideas about how you couldn't have a proper relationship or you couldn't do certain types of exercises. So I can see why. Um, Z and yourself started to create th this conversation and it's um it would have been quite radical <laughs> back when you started to do it but yeah. I still find that there are people who are anxious about working online and delivering schema therapy online because of the experiential components and certainly mm. in my other baby um, EMDR, we have the same issues where I see people saying, can you even do EMDR online? Um, and both are possible. Uh, and it's really about how creative you're going to be and what technologies you're willing to use um, yeah. to make that happen. Certainly with schema therapy, maybe we don't need the technology quite so much, but with EMDR, sometimes that does come in handy. Um, mm. So actually, I, might, I know I did say we'd talk about online um, limited reparenting as well. But um, in your experience, how can people start to get more comfortable with delivering the experiential exercises, so the chair work and the imagery rescripting mm -hmm. and some of the other emotion-focused techniques in the online space? Yeah. Um, well, I think that um, I, I, I'm not too familiar with um, EMDR, so uh, I'm not sure if, if you can well, generalize no, what I'm no, saying I'm, to the yeah. EMDR. No, don't worry about that. That was just me saying generally with EMDR. Yeah. But as we're talking for schema therapy made simple today, um, 
um, <laughs> what are your tips to help do the experiential work from schema therapy in this online space for those people who still feel a bit worried about offering that work? Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe um, to begin with just some uh, points to remember that may reduce anxiety is that online therapy also has benefits for the client, right? Like if you do imagery work, <clears throat> then they can stay. They can stay and rest at home a little bit. They can take some time before they shift, you know, from some powerful intervention to the daily life. Uh, they're in their own space. They don't need to come out and, I don't know, take a cab or drive or deal with all this, you know, overwhelming things outside. And also to remember that the instructions and the technique is no different. Mm -hmm. The safety protocol issue is no different. And you can always have a contingency plan, like for internet dropouts, like we move to phone call or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if people talk specifically about imagery scripting, um, I think, you know, to start with um, assessment for stability or stressability, impulsivity, that is something that I would be worried about with clients um, with these issues, especially if they're away, like in another country or, mm -hmm. you know, another, um, sorry, I this something happening here. Um, keep them, you know, the window of tolerance, don't work beyond. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, Nadine, if you look at the two of us, right, we, we, we can see each other mm -hmm. in, in a very closed frame of space <laughs> and, and, and breathing. So, Mm -hmm. It is possible and, and quite easy to pay uh, close attention to somatic changes in the clients, right? To see if they're dissociate, uh, dissociated or overwhelmed. Um, another tip with uh, injury scripting would be probably to, invent, to invest longer time before you start to create mm -hmm. like, a safer and closer relationship and also to work more gradually with imagery. So I'll start, I'll always start with just short, pleasant situations, meeting the child, creating the relationship uh, with the child before we go into more traumatic or difficult uh, memories. Mm. Um, yeah, remember that clients must have at least a small, healthy adult mode to do it and maybe you need to, work, to take more time to make sure that they can get your guidance for grounding even if they're not near mm. um, yeah. setting up some objects in the room for self-soothing in their room so kind of preparing it in advance and, and but make sure they don't use it for detachment um, yeah, I think maybe generally. Yeah, so I, I mean, when you talk about those things, they're things that we would be aiming to do in a physical space as well. But I think the distinction is perhaps you need to screen um, a bit more closely for some things just to make sure you're not taking on an online client that then you're going to have like you know I know even for me there's some countries where I would think that's just a bit too hard for me to manage if something didn't go well or you know I know so you and I emailed recently about a supervisory question and um and about the whether it would work to have an online therapist for that particular person who had a history of psychosis. And we were both sort of on the opinion that was a bit risky. So things like that, that are going to be less of an issue in a face-to-face um, -face physical um, space yeah. relationship. Absolutely. So, yeah, but I do like some of those um, tips about setting up um, even grounding or comforting objects in the space mm -hmm. so it's there and you don't have to get the client to hunt around 
<laughs> if things start right. 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 So that's gonna... issue. oh god i need a glass of water or okay so just prepare everything in advance right yeah um but i'm not sure about you sometimes i have clients turn up in cars and all sorts of things that are not predictable in the online space so that it doesn't always work out but i think if you set the parameters at the beginning you may be less likely um, to do that and actually something i was talking about was um some clients here ring us from their cars while they're driving i don't know if you've experienced and I, I personally i don't allow it i don't no. mind this is where they can have the, the therapy and it provides the consistency, but I would insist of them stopping the yeah. sides. It's, you know, it's um, and scary. some reports, it's yeah, some reports I've had, they've had the video on as well, which is just dangerous. But um, I decided after doing it a couple of times that actually I didn't feel the client was um, engaged enough in the process because I could sort of sense the driving decisions that were being made which is appropriate, you know, has to stay safe in the car. But these are the sorts of things that can happen when you don't have um, clients right in front of you that you need to manage. Um, also, so just on this topic, um, is there any evidence that online therapy could be more effective or are there any types of people that you've found that can be more effective for than face-to-face mm. -face gamer therapy? Mm. Um. I'm not sure about like you know evidence based yeah. uh, <laughs> research on the efficiency, uh, um, but I think you know generally I think that maybe the biggest um, benefit or is that when someone is in his own uh, place. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to go to the expert's office, dress up, wearing makeup and all that stuff. It tends to be kind of more in eye level. Um, you know, so the client, I think I would find that many clients feel less anxious. Mm -hmm. And like when they're on their own place, they're also all the other things that they can, you know, maybe... Okay, maybe we'll talk about it later. But um, yeah, I think this is the best, like the biggest benefit that it's mm. I don't feel quite natural yeah. in comfy clothes and and mm. yeah, that, that's yeah. I, and I'd have to agree. And actually, I've had all of my therapy in recent years online. And the other benefit is you can access people that are not local to you. Um, and sometimes for therapists, right. that's really important because we're all so interconnected. Um, but I found the same that I found it actually better than all the face to face therapy I'd had. Although, one thing I would do sometimes is I might be in this room and try and do the therapy. And I've since realized that's probably, unless I'm not working at all, it's, I really should be at home to do it. So you, you can yeah. start to get a bit like, oh, I'll just squeeze it in here and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, and I think there is an aspect of it, perhaps for some people, um, if you're a bit hypervigilant, for example, that it's more, it feels safer and more relaxing not to have an actual person right there in front of you as well. It's a, it's a little bit different. So that yeah. might be an advantage as well. Yeah, although this is something that, uh, you know, if, if that's the issue, that's the, that's the real uh, interaction, like the physical interaction um, is, um, you know, raising anxiety. Then, of course, only if it's a local <laughs> client that would insist at a certain point it will come over because otherwise it might, um, um, you know, it, it might be kind of avoidance. Mm. No, yeah, cool. no, definitely. And um, certainly there's been an, an argument in Australia, for example, that for socially anxious clients, they definitely prefer this medium, but perhaps it isn't the best option for them because it, it maintains yeah. avoidance. Yeah. But I think maybe to start um, right. the connection, it's a way to create some level of safety and um, then to be able to take that next step 
and yeah, I mean, of course, and with severe yeah. and with severe uh, social anxiety, even this kind of interaction is challenging enough, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yesterday I was speaking to someone who works with a client who doesn't even have the camera on because they can't bear to be looked at, and yeah. so you know we're trying to work out how to move to the next level of um, having some exposure to being seen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So part of gradual, right? Gradual exposure. <laughs> yeah, so. that's right. And it's just yeah. it's quite challenging, I think, once that's been established. So um with anything where there's a lot of phobic avoidance anyway, it's hard to move to that next step. So you have to be sort of gently pushing at it, but not so much that the client disengages mm. altogether. Uh -huh. um, Again, window of tolerance, right? We, we want to make it useful, mm -hmm. not to, yeah. Not to have mm. it too much mm. yeah. yeah I have to say as a therapist I find um working blind I call it when I can't see people really challenging um so I, I that's where I love the video because I feel like you do get enough feedback to connect um but even I find to concentrate um say if I do a session on the phone it's much harder for me to concentrate if someone's oh, yeah. there. And so I don't yeah. think I'm the best therapist in that situation either. But it, mm. yeah. So there is a point yeah. I think where I wonder if phone therapy can be as good, like if they did research between phone uh, video conferencing. Mm -hmm. And I suspect yeah. this might not be quite so good. But no. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm not familiar with, with research in, in this type of, of uh, comparisons, but I do know that recent research about the efficiency and the, the, um, the preferences of the mm. clients shows really high score for online therapy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Personally, for me, on like uh, this telehealth with no video, just phone. It's very draining. It's really hard for me. It's hard, like, not to see the reaction and, and, and like, the mm. facial expression. The, yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the other the part of the um, discussion that we were going to have today was about the limited reparenting relationship. Great. So for those um, people who aren't very familiar with schema therapy, I wondered if you might uh, introduce to them what limited reparenting is in schema therapy. Sure, sure. So limited reparenting is, I would say, like a wide stance in schema therapy. I used to, to metaphorically address it as like the, the big umbrella. that Everything else is done, you know, under it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's kind of the heart of the schema therapy um, where like everything, every intervention is done under this concept. And it's mm -hmm. coming from the basic idea that schemas are created when four emotional needs in childhood are unmet, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, uh, this stance aims to meet emotional four needs, uh, either through injury work, or in the therapy relationship itself, mm -hmm. right? So in this way, um, it provides kind of antidote to the early experience uh, by meeting the needs that were and still unmet. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to say a bit more, then practically it's not only about warm and acceptance, mm -hmm. but also like, put a very clear map of the client's unmet needs and hold it, you know, in a very specific way for each client. Like, for example, um, you know, not providing solutions uh, to a client with dependency schema, like mm -hmm. just to do the, the other thing, just to do the other thing, encouraging him to, uh, to think for itself, for himself, to find his own solutions. Well, of course, with some guidance, but uh, while for someone with emotional deprivation schema, for example, with a focus of lack of guidance in his life, we will provide guidance very generously, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, or uh, encouraging playfulness or human or humor with a client who grew up in a very tough or demanding or cold environment uh, and has, for example, emotional limitation schema. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a general uh, attitude that the, 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 the um, therapist holds. And of course, it also contains uh, specific reactions to certain behaviors that are schema or mode driven, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, for the same client with the emotional inhibition, uh, <laughs> uh, I would react maybe even ex a bit exaggerated way when he's doing something more light or fun I would say something like oh this part of you is so adorable mm -hmm. you know it's really fun being with you when you are you know like that or um not not to take the um the automatic yes I will <laughs> of a compliant client just to say no you don't need to do that. I know you're, you're used to it. That's what you learn. But you don't need to do it here. I'm really interested in your real uh, wishes or feelings. So, yeah, um, th this is generally about mm -hmm. the, the way we use it in, um, in the therapeutic relationship. So, mm -hmm. Can give more examples if it still feels unclear. No, no, I think that that's good. Um, and I think, like for me, that's what makes the therapy quite different to some for CBT, for example. We're not thinking about the core unmet uh, emotional yeah. needs. It's more about um, skills and behaviors and ways of changing thinking to get improved functioning, and it's quite symptom driven. Whereas with schema therapy, we're really you know, good schema therapy anyway is about what are these core unmet emotional needs? And it's something, you know, I find people get very focused on, oh, I need to learn how to do imagery or scripting really well or chair work really well. But that isn't actually the schema therapy. And you could have yeah. schema therapy as a client and not do either of those things as long as it's founded on this idea of core unmet emotional needs and the limited reparenting, it's still schema therapy. And I guess it's hard to, for example, sell a course about relationship stuff, but I actually think I would love to see something like that come out in the space because that is what makes schema therapy what it is. Um, and, and it's not really intervention driven in the way that perhaps other therapies are. Um, right. But yeah, I do think that's probably hard to teach outside um, of supervision. Yeah. I, I, I actually provided twice in Israel uh, mm -hmm. workshops on the, on the um, uh, mm -hmm. relationship in schema therapy. I agree with you totally. I think mm -hmm. this is really the heart of everything. Okay, you can be a great technician, <laughs> right? Doing wonderful chair work, which is important. I'm not saying that it's not important mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. all the other stuff. Um, but that I think this is what makes schema therapy different. And I think that this is also why schema therapy has such a low uh, rate of dropouts mm. clients. There is something, um, yeah, very... Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah, and and I think for me as a therapist, I'm trained in a variety of therapies, but until I really started to fully embed that idea of limited reparenting and core unmet emotional needs, I wasn't really um, fully understanding the people that I was working with. And I'm not to say that I always fully understand them, but I feel at least the underpinnings of it are in the right place. And I can be a lot more empathic because I'm viewing it, all the things that happen between us through this lens. Exactly, exactly. And I think one of maybe the biggest tips would be really like get yourself really um, like with a clear, a clear picture of your client as a child mm. in the environment where he grew up. And I think that's really helpful when you deal with uh, challenging modes or <laughs> challenging, challenging clients. 
when you keep a clear vision, mm. you find as a child what mm. we did back then, like what he was missing, how we mm. dealt with it. It's so helpful. And then like it's, it's like uh, going back in a, um, in a time channel, mm. right? And, and meeting with this child. So not only in imagery, it's really like seeing the child using the client mm. and be focused on providing, uh, yeah, to, mm. to meet the needs. So yeah, yeah. Um, and so in terms of limited reparenting in the online space, is there anything about it that's different, do you think, or would it be hmm. very similar? Yeah, I think um, generally, you know, it's if you think about the media restricting or the, 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 the situation that are in the, in the therapy relationship, Probably there's no much difference, but um, I think that, you know, when you think about the online setting and the way uh, the space itself, the setting itself might trigger uh, some schemas and mm -hmm. modes, it's actually um, provides maybe more opportunities mm -hmm. to uh, provide limited reparenting, for example, um, dealing with effectiveness shame schema when someone having like technology phobia or problems, or how do you like how do you respond for bad internet connections? Because for many people it would be very triggering, and for each client it would trigger a different schema, right? Punitiveness, unrelenting standards, uh, subjugation, entitlement different coping styles so i think when 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 you keep the same understanding of the unmet needs that beyond the schemas that are activated mm -hmm. um you've got really beautiful opportunities for um for limited day reparenting mm -hmm. um yeah there's maybe also some challenges in the in the online setting like Mm, if you think about what's going on in the client side, mm. um, maybe some interruptions like pets or kids coming in, the news of drinks and food. So again, you know, if it's a client with some limits issue, when you have this understanding of how to provide limited reparenting, you will work on limits, on, on setting uh, limits, right? Mm. And if it's a client, um, is more inhibited or deprived emotionally, maybe it can be a good thing. It's contribute to the sense of closeness. Uh, can you imagine an inhibited client uh, when his pet is coming in? You'll see a completely different part mm. of this client, right? So there are some opportunities and challenges with it. Mm. Um, one more thing that they might, um, you yeah, know, two things that the maybe it's also important to keep in mind when you think about the online setting is I think that the, the, the transitional object issue. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, you can send a voice message or, or, or mm -hmm. a video flashcard and stuff like that or just using the mail. But I have to admit that I do miss the, um, uh, the spontaneity of it. Like when you go uh, for vacation, and your client is in the room and you like something in the room and you can just say, oh, do you like it? Okay, you can have it till I'm back right. from my vacation. <laughs> we can do it online. Yes, um, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, yeah. Um, and also, you know, if your client is from another city or from another country, uh, you don't have... Uh, I don't even know how to say it properly in English, like common spots, like a, a, a popular coffee place, or restaurant that everyone knows. And it might feel a bit distanced, you know, they, they've never been in your office, they don't know, like, where do you see how to kind of yeah. <laughs> integrate you into... Um, so all that context is, is gone, isn't it? Like all that... Right. Yeah, 
Uh, I think yeah. that it is a real challenge um, about doing online work with someone in a place that you've never been to either. And it's sort of like, you know, with cultural things that there can just be a lot about a context and an environment that um, then the client has to educate you a lot all the time about that. Right, um, right. Yeah. You know, I do find it so different when I work with clients and, and I work with clients really from so many different places in the world, so many cultures from China to uh, East Europe and West Europe and Jordan and, <laughs> and Canada and the US, so everyone. And I do, like, if this is a very um, unfamiliar culture, I do like kind of a research before to understand at least mm. that cultural uh, aspect of feelings, of emotions, of mm. those. That is really important uh, when you guide your client to uh, express feelings. If it's appropriate in his culture, you might harm him, right, in, in his yeah. environment. Mm. So it's really important. Mm. And yeah, just ask, ask. So how is it in China? How people usually react to, well, what is, yeah, this is very important. I think always, also mm. in Israel, when I work with very uh, orthodox people, which is completely different culture, completely, completely, mm. really. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like a different nation. Um, I ask, I ask a lot of questions. So how is it? Is it okay in your uh, society to do that or to say that um, so I can mm -hmm. kind of adjust my uh, you know yeah and so it's really embracing that cultural humility idea of not knowing and and asking them about what it is rather than assuming as well um, because yeah. yeah we can do a bit of research but if that person isn't um you know, even within the context of Israel that we're talking about, clearly there's different types of people that live there and live very different yeah. lifestyles. So um, it is important to to keep our perspective open there. Um, but yeah, I think when I was, we were talking more generally just about the locality aspects of that creates a sense of familiarity for a client. We can almost feel like you're a floating therapist from somewhere because they've got no sense of where you are and <laughs> And that sort yeah. of thing. So yeah, that's it. How did you develop a practice where um, people, I mean, this is a very big reach of, of international clients you've just mentioned there. So how did that come to be that people from all these different places find you? <laughs> I'm still asking myself the same question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure, honestly, I'm not sure. I think it, it started... Um, quite, I don't know, mystically somehow with my first clients. And then uh, it just started to roll over through supervisees from different countries. So they kind of, you know, uh, referred um, friends or, or, you know, clients or, yeah. So <laughs> this is how it created and hmm. yeah, it's, and is it mostly through the ISST community and connections or is it um, just your reputation within Israel? How did that all come about? Sorry. Oh, I'm just, you know, because I think um, it sounds like a lot of the online stuff internationally happened through supervision of um, schema therapy. I'm not sure if I understood that right. Yeah. yeah. So are most of the clients seeking schema therapy from you or is it CBT as well? Um, I think more and more schema therapy. Uh, but maybe it's also about, uh, you know, I think all over the world, therapists are really busy now, right? We're all like overbooked and waiting list and stuff. So... <laughs> Maybe the current situation is because my preference to schema therapy, so I'm kind of, mm. <laughs> you know, prepared to take clients and super and supervises um, schema therapy rather than CBT. Yeah, uh, I do train some uh, supervision groups of CBT uh, students, mm. but still it's kind of you know 
Um, yeah, but. Okay. Um, so I'm just thinking, um, one of the things that I find as a supervisor is that supervisees will often say, um, their online sessions become like conversational. We call it chit chat in Australia, where you just, yeah. um, and they don't have as much of an issue with that in the face to face setting. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas of why that happens. Hmm. That's a good question because the setting actually provides the same opportunity, right? <laughs> really work deeply. And actually, when I supervise um, people and they record their, they all, they, many of them work on Zoom and they've got yeah. so many uh, tapes, even for rating that are in Zoom. Their, their beautiful work is done uh, mm -hmm. online. Uh, maybe it's more about uh, the therapist's uh, attitude how it's online, how serious it is, how real it is. I think if you relate to it as, okay, this is a regular therapy session and your mindset and you're not, um, you know, just allow yourself because you're from home or because your client is not nearby. Uh, so you don't kind of taking yourself out of the mindset of therapy, like, okay, so I have a cancellation, then maybe I'll do the laundry, or all kinds of things that, that really <laughs> takes you off the, the, the therapy mindset. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I don't know, I know, I think for me, um, when I, for the last few months, I actually haven't seen any of my clients or supervisees in person. I work every day only online. Uh, big mm -hmm. problems with my <laughs> with my eyes. <laughs> um, but the more the more I, I do it, like uh, kind of not back to back, but mm. systematically online, I'm there. I'm just yeah. It's the same. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, I I suspect it's something to do with avoidance and. Um, perhaps not structuring the session online similarly to how you would structure a session in person. And I'm not, I'm not instructing because I, I'm quite good at structuring sessions. I don't have that problem. In fact, it's harder for me not to do experiential work with people than to mm. do it. So, and sometimes mm. it sounds like how could that be a weakness, but it sort of is, I think sometimes people do just need a space to talk and be in the relationship without um, having their therapists do a float back or or whatever but yeah, yeah. so that's my, my suspicion is that something happens um, between the client and the therapist and they collude in this avoidance together and it suddenly it's like oh 40 minutes in <laughs> <laughs> oh we can't do that now um but yeah i, I, yeah, I haven't been like, maybe to, next time yeah because <laughs> i haven't been able to understand why it, it seems to be an issue. And some people also say they regularly run over in an online session. Um, mm, they feel they need to compensate might. their client for less. <laughs> yeah, there's something there. Or maybe even just the, the screen is not, or the room's not set up so that you can keep check of time a bit yourself. I, I don't know. Mm. But it's, yeah, it's interesting to me that I, I often get asked that. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about, which I still find in Australia gets asked a little bit, which is how do you do the chair work online? Um, mm -hmm. Do you yeah. want to talk about that? Because I always think you might sure. as well cover it, seeing it's asked so much. Yeah, sure. Actually, I think it's, uh, it's a very popular question and, and the things are quite, quite easy. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, just as you work in your office, make sure you know what you're going to do. Okay, are you going to um, uh, to facilitate mode dialogues or are you going to fight um, an inner critic or interview a mode? So just start with something very structured and clear, like where, where you're going. And when you work with your client, there are actually many options. You can be really creative and work within the limitations uh, in the client side. Uh, so if this room is big enough 
and mm -hmm. you can just push his, his laptop a bit farther, you can help him uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, create the architecture of the chairs uh, properly. Uh, if the room is small, there's not enough chairs, you can just move, you know, you're the same chair. Mm -hmm. Even like this. Okay, so this is one part of you. And this is another part of you. Oh, great. I won't move this chair because it's really heavy. But if it's, <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a lighter, right? If it's a lighter chair, you can move. Uh -huh. You can have had a chair work with a client who uh, was quite young and she was still living with her, uh, with her parents. So she was uh, having the therapy from her bedroom and she only her, had her, her bed. We kind of moved mm -hmm. the right, the left, to the center. Mm -hmm. Not, not um, yeah, it wasn't very difficult. Uh, using objects. Yeah presentations and so you did some really nice ones with the ducks right yeah but also um i've got i just get the clients i've just got some stuff here but i would typically because many of my people when they turn up online um they never seem to have an extra chair or a chair that they can move much like this is too heavy so i generally go with the objects and i find just exactly like that wow. and it doesn't even have to be an object that particularly represent something just the act of holding two mm. different things yeah um yeah. seems to and, and the directions right the instructions like okay yeah. so just take a moment just close your eyes take a moment and try to be this part right be this part yeah and even just this instruction kind of shifting mm. or okay so stand up if you can't move okay it's been that part now you want to change okay so just stand up Mm -hmm. Maybe shake your body, sit again, and just be the other part. Be mm -hmm. that part, and just do a little movement to kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, change change the vibe. Or, yeah. And another another important tip is when uh, you stick to a certain specific mode. Right. Make sure that you don't talk to your client like you you where you where your gaze is going to. So if I want to talk to the clients, uh, let's say that you put your punitive parent mm -hmm. on this side of you, and I'm going to say, okay, Nadine, I'm going to, I want to say something to this part of you. And I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to this part, and I'm going to make very sure and change my, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we can take the, the chair out of the room. Okay, just take this chair, take it out. Yeah. We don't need it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, really, I think um, you can. It sounds like you can just use the environment and use the chairs, and you've given us some great uh, ideas about where to look and how to. But also, it really doesn't even have to be about chairs. It's really about two different states and and finding a way for right. them to be able to shift. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's about externalizing, right? The, the different modes, there are so many ways to do it. And I think, you know, also all the way that we can make the client feel that we're with them, like, okay, maybe I'm with you. Can, can you sense me? Can you just give me your hand? Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, great, give me five or whatever. Mm -hmm. So all these little things that you can do uh, to make the client feel more safe if we're talking about experiential work or any mm -hmm. like emotional um, activation intervention uh, mm -hmm. moving forward so like mm -hmm. make a sense of closeness or like more facial expression stronger facial expression using your hands this part this part right so yeah. Yeah, you know, I thank you so much for, for all of this today. But I think this last little bit, we can really see the expert that you are in the online space. Um, and it just flows naturally out of you all. You could do it this way or you could do it that way. Um, and, you know, I hope that people do watch uh, through to this bit and, and see it because it's a real highlight. Um, I'm just wondering before we finish up, is there anything coming up for you that you'd like to talk about maybe that you're offering soon? Um, either in Israel or internationally? Um, not at the moment. 
not at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, maybe yeah, just the book that I mentioned. So I'll just send you so you can share uh, right. with the group. The, the oh, that would be so generous. Thank you. Many of these tips are there, and yeah. the, the thoughts of like you know schemas and modes activations and stuff like that. I am uh, actually on the third, third part of my training program at the moment. Uh, so this is kind of <laughs> over the top. Yeah. Well, again, unrelenting standards is a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> passion kind of, as well, yeah. isn't it? You know, you're passionate about it and you've got something to offer. And that does take time and commitment. So yeah, and I, just to remind everyone that the online training is available through Schema Therapy Training Online. It's still there if you want to experience more of um, the wonderful Hagara and also Dr. Z Liu together. Um, for those of you who are still wanting a bit more about um, how to bring Schema Therapy to life in the online space so that they can find more of you there. Um, but yeah, if you could send the chapter through, I mean, I'll enjoy to read that myself. Um, but I uh, thank you so much for being here today. Is there anything you wanted thank to say you for before? having me? Oh, it's been great. So I'll just we'll say goodbye to Facebook uh, now, and I'll just chat to you briefly <laughs> offline. So bye, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Bye. bye.